uh, going live today. So what's cool about today is, is one, everybody's been going on Zoom Live, Facebook Live, everything. And uh, so today what's cool is, is I got Hans Finzel, um, who's actually in Colorado, that's on his Facebook Live. So we're promoting off a couple different platforms, his pages, we're promoting on Instagram. And it's funny because if you, if you were watching us the last three to four times, we have had technical difficulties trying to get set up. And what's great about it is that's a perfect example of what is happening today and how we're going to lead into this segment. So Hans, you know, why don't you go give a shout out to all your people on Facebook and say, what's up, Hans? Hey, everybody. Welcome to uh, our Facebook Live. And this has been hilarious if you watched the first two clips that we had to stop. And this is being replicated millions of times all over America, all over the world, people trying to work from home. Now, you and I already work from home, but we're trying to do some new things right now by simultaneously recording a Zoom call, doing Facebook Live, Instagram, and what, what other platform was that it? Yeah, so, yeah, no, Zoom, Instagram, and Facebook Live. So three, three platforms. Yeah, with, we're doing a three for, a three for one. <laughs> with, two different, with two different audiences. So we hoped, we, we did this today because we hoped that we could reach a little bit more people. Um, and, I, and it was funny because I told Hans uh, last week, I texted him and I go, Hans, I have a great idea. And so I'm a big, big follower of Hans, even though you, I'm going to give you some good, good props here, Hans. So even though Hans is my co-author, um, he is my mentor. I follow him religiously. I use his books in my leadership teachings. And I even promote, like I said, promote his podcast and everything. So what's great about this is I was going through the book last week and I'm like, oh my gosh. I'm like, Hans, again, you are a visionary. You you saw this coming. Like, so it was really cool. I told Hans there's some really good points in the book. And I think this is a perfect segment to lead into Hans talking about what change is and how change is like a slinky, you know, if you want to say anything else before Hans, this is not yeah. scripted. So whatever. Okay. Well, I just saw a friend of ours from uh, Budapest, Hungary. Aniko Kobes is watching Facebook live. So, Hey Aniko. And uh, some people may not know they're going to be watching this live. They don't know about our book. So the one that you and I co-authored is millennial boom, helping millennials and boomers thrive together in life and work. That's how we came together. That's how we met. We wrote this book together. Uh, but today we're talking about a different topic, the topic of change. Because if there's one thing everybody is facing right now, it's massive change. So the name of my book that I wrote a number of years ago is Change is Like a Slinky. So let me just tell you a little bit about the slinky. Uh, I raised four children. We have 10 grandchildren. And I still think the greatest toys. Yeah, where's your slinky, man? I don't have a slinky. I was just thinking that. I was like, what the heck? I'm going to be like 10 times. I've got a bunch of them here at the house. I should have uh, pushed one through the. Yeah, you have, hold on. Uh, push, push it through the internet to you. <laughs> didn't work. Best toys don't have any batteries. And so even you just had a power outage because in the first video we tried we had a you had a power outage yeah the my second, lights flickered off then the second one i realized they weren't hearing my audio on facebook live so uh oh we got some more watchers this is great i'm just waving to our watchers uh, awesome should i just start by telling you why i chose the slinky yeah i would love how i looked at it so as i'm reading the book you know, Hans gives a great overview right off the top is the intro to kind of how change, you know, pretty much is the intro to change is like a slinky. I say you give that just a quick overview of how you became of all this. Well, because I was in leadership and if there's one thing you realize when you lead an organization is you have to become an expert in leading people through change. And something about human nature, people hate change. You remember the book, uh, Who Moved My Cheese by Spencer Johnson? Great book on change about these little mice and this little maze. And some they were always used to get their cheese in the very same spot. And somebody moved the cheese. And that's the whole book. Well, he says a change imposed is a change opposed. Well, hey, how many changes are being imposed on us right now, Patrick? A lot. I mean, a lot. In every business, every industry, every segment has something going on, some type of change happening. And it's very fast and very abrupt. It's, it's very crazy right now, as everyone's saying, right? And it's being imposed upon us. 
we have no choice. You yeah. will go home. Somebody told me the other day, God must be mad at us because he sent us all to our room. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll get even better than this one. Ready? All I, right. I'm not trying to one up, but it's like, listen, I was grounded half of my life by the time I was 18. You know, a couple of weeks isn't going to hurt me, you know? I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, I was grounded for a while. Yeah, and me, I'm an introvert. This is like an introvert's dream come true. I just <laughs> Go to it. your house, watch Netflix. <laughs> Don't talk to anybody. <laughs> well, this has been a good opportunity for people. And I told, I said this, and you talk about this even in the book is, you know, there's a difference between proactive and reactive. T today is a time to be reactive and resilient within opportunity, not going after and being proactive and being aggressive, right? I mean, these are two different worlds we're living in. And a lot of people, whether they're in sales, operations, marketing, a physical product, right? This change has just smacked them. Either business has come to a complete halt or business has ramped up massively for them. So I got into the topic of change because I was leading an organization that was on a death spiral and I had to turn it around. So I'm a turnaround uh, expert. And I realized people resist change. People uh, love to hang on to the old, you know, because the old is comfortable, like your favorite couch or your favorite chairs people prefer the certainty of their misery than the misery of uncertainty well we are living in uncertain yeah. times so i became kind of a student of change organizational change read a lot of books about it did a lot of experimenting and we did turn around our organization we took it out of the death spiral and brought it into a big growth cycle and that's that's when i wrote this book change is like a slinky and I want to take you all as we talk together through some of the fundamentals because you can navigate change. And I'd like to encourage you to make change your friend instead of your enemy. I agree. But, because as I say in the book, only those people who are willing to be flexible are going to survive. Learners, you know, one of my favorite poems I have in all of my books is in times of change, learners inherit the earth while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. Well, our world is changing dramatically. And, and you know, I don't know uh, what the new normal is going to be when this is all over, but it can be a great thing. So I, I chose the slinky uh, because it's a great illustration of change. One thing about change, it's messy, it's noisy, it's unpredictable. Now, what do you... What do you do with a, a slinky? That Well, the first thing you do is you do this, right? But the second thing you do with a slinky that uh, when I was a kid, we would send it down the stairs, Bingo. right? And, it, and, it and in the book, I talk about how this was invented and, and by accident. And, you know, this guy became a gazillionaire by accident by in inventing this little toy. He was on a Navy ship and he was working with springs, but when you send it down the stairs, you never know where it's going to end up. Yeah. Never know where it's going to land. And that's one of the first principles of change. You can say, all right, I'm going to go from point A to point B, but you don't know where point B is really going to be. Correct. So one of the first lessons is change is unpredictable and where everything ends up, we do not know. And I think that Patrick is why there's a lot of anxiety right now in our um, culture is because um, uh, we don't know where this is going to end, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, like the president's trying to put a date on when it's going to be over, but we don't know. And that's given us a lot of anxiety. Yeah, I, I, I definitely, I definitely agree. And it's funny because when I think of a, a, a slinky too, I always think of uh, <laughs> what it was, I think it was the, pet detective ace ventura what do you I think it was number two and he, he went down the entire steps he got to the last uh, the last step and he's like can we do it again <laughs> you know it was like uh it's it's so crazy that right now is when we talk about everything i mean right think about myself in produce and supply chain from today of now trying to talk to our restaurants our food service it's there is nothing right now it's unpredictable People are asking us, oh, hey, what do you see the summer crops doing, the summer pricing? And, and it's unpredictable. I mean, we can give them an update on the crop, but that all can change, right? I mean, 
everything can change. And, and people keep asking me, what do you think is going to happen? I said, we're just taking this day by day. I mean, we're going to live life like it's a normal, normal day. We're going to supply as needed. But at the end of the day, uh, we almost got to take it as a normal day. Orders are up, you know, so demands through the roof. Prices are, are, are decent are okay. Uh, but the goal here is to make sure that there's food in the stores, right? That's, that's right. the main, that's like the main goal. But it's unpredictable. It's scary at times. We don't know what's going to happen. The ports are shutting down. So all of this to me is uncertainty and unpredictable. And I even see this affecting the outside of other industries, right? It's like, it's like a table. It's just a domino effect. We're all connected. When you think technology is not connected to a piece of produce or leadership isn't connected uh, back to the church, right? All these different ways we're all connected by this social bubble too. That it's any when one industry hits, it, it technically has a ripple effect, and we're seeing this now. Unpredictability and where we're going to be in thirty days, I, I don't, I don't know. So but let's you do talk. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Say, let's talk about the uh, the cycle. I have what I call my six stages of change, and I and I think it might be helpful to take our listeners through real quickly. Uh, yeah, the first thing is accept the need for change. Uh, you know, you might think, well, duh. Well, a lot of people resist change. And the first step is you have to accept things are changing, that things are going to be different. And uh, again, yeah. like I said a moment ago, people prefer the certainty of their misery than the misery of uncertainty. So my first message is you're going to have to learn to embrace some uncertainty. Uh, and accept yep. the need for change. A lot of people are are learning how to work from home right now, and they're learning how to isolate themselves from their friends. You've got to accept it. We're we're navigating a new world, and instead of fighting it and getting depressed, say, well, you know what? This might be the best thing that ever happened in my business. Yeah. You know, I, in my wife's business, the nutrition business, the Juice Plus, she, our company has been uh, preparing technologically for this for 10 years. And it's kind of cool that we we're able to do our work and our business. I mean, yeah, our, our home office had to shut down and everybody had to go work at home, but it's working because right. technology was already there. Now, there are a lot of industries that are just scrambling. The school system, my son, Mark, is... Four kids, they're sent home from school. Yep. Their school was not ready technologically to, to have school, uh, virtual school, so they're scrambling. But no, number one principle, Patrick, we have to accept the need for change. I agree. We have to. And I think it's gonna. It's more common. It's, I, I feel that this will help be the, the new common, is to accept change. So when, when someone comes to ask a question, it's going to be, I, and we're going to talk about this, listen to right? Because that's what it is. I think before it was the status quo, right? And that's the next thing. Why change? Well, you say to better the status quo, right? And right. I think that's what's going to happen. There's going to be a new status quo. And well, we don't know what that's going to be. No. We have no idea what the new normal is going to be. And, and I think in one way, we're all longing to go back to the good old days of two, two months ago. Uh, and we made right not the good old days all the good old days when not two months ago yeah, you know? two months <laughs> ago the good old back i remember when my wife and i used to go out to eat oh man that was awesome back way then. back in the oh you know how long has it been 20 years no no uh, two months yeah two months but, we've been stuck inside for two months help yeah so <laughs> I, I i go through my reasons for changing and i actually have a long list of like 21 reasons why organizations need to consider change, but a lot of them have to do with failure. You're not making money. Yep. Stagnating. You're on a decline. Like I said, when I took over uh, the ministry world venture uh, uh, in back 25, 30 years ago, and I led it for 20 years, we were on a death spiral. And the reason we needed to change is because we were declining. Yeah. We we weren't recruiting new people. We were financially tanking. And for a lot of organizations, uh, they need to realize things like the changing nature of our customers, the changing nature of the workforce. And again, uh, you and I wrote Millennial Boom because of the very issue of the changing nature of the workforce, right? 
the millennials true. are the new worker and boomers a lot of boomers don't like millennials and no. a lot of millennials don't like boomers so that's why we got into a millennial boom true but i want you know i want to throw something out there is because i've seen this a lot so and i and i texted you about this and this is going back to the millennial boom there are a lot of millennials and boomers that, don't, that just dislike each other. But I'm going to tell you, that's just life, right? And I told Hans this week, this week we have had a lot of, of messages saying that uh, to me, not, uh, not to Hans, really, that, man, you, you just seem very boomer negative. And I had someone come up to me and say, even your book, look at it, the title, Millennial Boom. And, and I go, well, have you read the book? And they said, no. And I go, <laughs> <laughs> boom means boomer like some people think like millennial boom is like we're millennial then we're gonna boom. blow them up we're gonna like blow we're just blowing them up, up the boomer <laughs> this isn't boomer remover we're not we're not being negative this is a positive book to thrive in life and work and it might talk about five areas of conflict and and, and thinking out loud hans maybe we change that to five suggestions or five things that you know improve in the workplace right but this millennial boom listen if you're a boomer and xer um, I, Jen, a millennial right now, you need all, you need everyone to work together. Uh, we need to help each generation thrive in life and in work, right? So right. again, as Hans and I have turned awkwardness into opportunity, the same thing with this change. We need to turn awkwardness into opportunity. If someone needs help, jump on and help them. If you see someone lacking, help them. If you see some doing a good job, make sure you praise them. This change is crazy right now. Okay, so we are, uh, today we're talking about changes like a slinky, and I notice a lot of people are hopping on the Facebook Live, so I just want to remind them our topic is how to navigate change, and the first thing is we need to accept the need for change. A couple of the other reasons why organizations, businesses have to change is um, repeated failure, lack of clear goals and objectives, uh, decline in impact, uh, lack of alignment and we're going to talk about alignment that's number six but you have to accept the need for change got it got it now let's go got to it. let's go to number two aim because once you've decided okay a is not working we need to get to point b and as we're saying right now in the climate in which we're at a lot of people are scrambling to figure out b Yep. Change is about moving from point A to point B. And, and I'll tell you something, Patrick, people love point A <laughs> because it's the familiar. It's like their favorite chair at home. It's like their favorite pair of shoes. And they resist, they resist, and they resent change in moving to point B. But once you accept the fact, okay, I got to move to point B, then you need to start aiming. What's point B going to be? What's it going to look like? Right. Now, is there a secret to figuring out point B, where to aim? Well, in many ways, there are no secrets. It's a lot of trial and error. Like you're figuring out for the produce industry where you work, uh, you're trying to figure out, well, how are we gonna make this work in the new normal? Do you have some kind of special insight? Probably, you have a lot of wisdom and a lot of experience, but I bet you're experimenting, aren't, aren't you? There's no crystal ball, yeah. I mean, right, think about it like this. If, 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 the co if all the stores demanded all the fruit we picked within four weeks, what would we do in four weeks for fruit? So we, we're, everything's trial and error. How much to put out, what to produce, what to pick, what to pack, what to store. Yeah. And, and I would suggest you make a list of 10, the top, top 10 ideas of how to get to point B. How am I gonna figure Perfect. out the new normal? How am I gonna figure out how to do my work now in a different environment? Or even if it's not about the current uh, shelter in place environment, because this is, a, some of you will be listening to this when this is all blown over and the wave has gone through our society. And you're still gonna be trying to figure out the new normal. So one suggestion I always make is, just start with 10 ideas. Just write down, here's 10 possible ways that I could uh, fix my situation and try to improve it. And then you experiment. Good old trial and error. We don't know what's going to work until we try it. Uh, you know, WD-40, for men, it's like our favorite product at home, duct tape and WD-40. And it's called WD-40 because the 40th attempt to get it right worked, which means. Is that what it really means? Yeah. 
Oh, <laughs> it was the 40th attempt. At getting I just want to let everyone know, <laughs> WD-40, I don't even think I have a bottle. <laughs> even when I did own a house, that was Renee's department, I think. But that, I didn't even know it meant that. That was hilarious. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's a water around. display. WD, I think, stands for water displacement. But it's, it's probably, like Edison. It's probably, and the, wait, Dad, 40 more times. <laughs> yeah, wait, Dad. So... I mean, this is an age old story. People who are successful tried a whole lot of things that didn't work, Yep. but they didn't give up. They kept trying. And that's why, I mean, it'd be better if you could make a list of a hundred things and try them, but at least start with 10. So the second, you know, step in changing is aim, but let's move on to the third step, anticipate. Yep. anticipate. That's a big anticipate. one. Yeah. Anticipate what? Well, yeah. <laughs> Anticipate failure, anticipate, anticipate emotional turmoil, anticipate your enemies and your allies. Think about uh, the music industry. I love, my, Donna and I love American Idol. I know uh, we're baby boomers. We shouldn't be uh, loving American Idol. I don't know. You need to move to the voice, sir. <laughs> we like the voice. Donna likes the voice better. But in both cases, think about all these thriving musicians whose families are their greatest uh, detractors, you know, who their families say, oh, you, you're not going to be successful. You know, why don't you go out and get a real job? How many ah. times? How many? <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> no, that's life. Go on. Keep going. How many, how many really excess, successful artists we're told by their families, why don't you out and get go out and get a real job? In fact, Donna's been in her uh, nutritional business now 20 years, Juice Plus. And I, I tell you, I can't tell you how many people uh, told her, why don't you go get a real job? That's that's not a real job. Well, all I can say is we've been making real money for 20 years, keeping our family thriving. So yeah, right. Weird, isn't it? It's not a real job, but there does seem to be real money involved. <laughs> I, I've, listen, I've never seen the fake stuff being, uh, um, when they say it's not a real job, I, I've never seen the fake money go into my account. It's always been real money. So, <laughs> so anticipate your allies, anticipate the people that will help you along your journey and anticipate your resistors. And I have a really cool little uh, diagram in the book. I, actually, I think it's in a, one, a different one of my books, but it's a, uh, it's a, it's a continuum of um, the people that will always resist you and the people that'll be your raving fans. And I, I think it's about 15% resistors, naysayers, about 15% raving fans, but in the middle are the 70% who are the people from Missouri, the show me state, right? They're like, show me. And they're fence sitters. And it's fine because they're going to watch you. you. And when you become successful, they'll get off the fence and follow you. But you know, Patrick, some people have a real problem. And that who do you suppose a lot of people focus on in that continuum of three different populations? A lot of people focus on the resistors. I was going to say the negative ones. I was yeah, say they the focus on the negative ones, trying to turn them around, saying, well, I really can't move forward with those people being against me. They don't, they don't understand what I'm trying to do. So I'm going to put all my effort into convincing them I'm right. And so they'll follow me. Bad idea. Uh, Bad yeah. idea. Where should you put most of your energy? In the 15% who are the raving fans who are your allies, who become your, your uh, guiding coalition as you move toward change. So don't focus on the negative people. Right. Uh, turn them off, tune them out, and focus on the people that are say, hey, you know what? That might be a really good idea. Let's do it. And isn't it yep. too, Patrick, we like to follow positive people, not negative people. I agree. I mean, I was telling someone the other day, he, he called me and said, um, how are you doing, doing all this, you know, through this crisis? And I said, good, you know, obviously Hans, we're, we're in the midst of kind of going through changes because we're working on deals to be booked for, and now they might be canceled. I've had other events that are canceled. Um, but then the gentleman said, he goes, how are you doing though? I said, oh, good. And, and I, go, I pitched a couple of people last week and, 
and they just they just didn't like it. You know, they said I was negative, kind of the same things we talked about. And it was funny because he goes, you're just in front of the wrong people. He goes, those people you're in front of, he goes, they're jealous. They're naysayers. He goes, if anybody comes up to you after you give a, a speech or a professional speech somewhere and says, can I give you advice or can I give you some feedback? He, he was just like, you're in front of the wrong people. And those people, you go, they're, they're negative. They're followers, right? And we've learned that, right, Hans? They're followers. Yeah. They look at everything. They comment on everything. It might be negative, but they sure follow, right? So um, I do agree. We want to stay away from the negative people. Um, but as I always say, right, there's, there's there are always going to be those negative people that are just kind of grinding into it. Yeah, you were telling me about that you went to this uh, conference in Tampa not long ago uh, when people were still having conferences. And, yeah. Oh, and, back then. Oh. And, and you and you got, yeah, way back then, like <laughs> six weeks ago. And so uh, you were telling me about this one guy who was so, Boomer, who was so negative against you. And I, that's a great example. And that's, you know, we're talking about books and people reading books and you'll have the same thing. You'll have 15% of like, what a, I can't even believe they published this. What a piece of junk. And then you'll have people who like, you were saying, oh my gosh, this is the best thing I ever read. And then you'll have the middle people who are on the fence and they'll decide later. So uh, anyway, anticipate, that's, that's step number three. We're talking about changes like a slinky. Uh, we're talking about how to na navigate highly changing times. We've been through step number one, accept the need for change. Step number two, yep. um, aim. You aim. know, at your point B, we're moving from point A to point B. Number three, anticipate your adversaries and allies. And your, uh, anticipate your problems. Anticipate your opportunities. That's where we talk about a SWOT analysis. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. No, number, so, number four, I call attack. All right. And so another else. word, maybe another word for that would be action. You know, there are some people. There are some people who have what I call the the paralysis of analysis. <laughs> they just this term, yeah. keep thinking, 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 but they're afraid to pull the trigger. They're afraid to act. There's no substitute for action. Patrick, why do you suppose some people are afraid to act? I mean, I say it's afraid to afraid of failure. They, they don't know if it's going to work or not, so they don't want to act on it because see, being seen as a failure could be – it's a risk. It's the risk-reward. Exactly. The fear. Fear of All failing. All kinds of fear. If there's one thing that paralyzes us, it's fear. Fear of failure, fear of, fear of embarrassment. Uh, you know, in the, in the Asian world, China, uh, that whole Asian culture, they have fear of losing face. And it's huge. Yep. It's huge in the Asian culture, fear of losing face. So for a whole lot of fears, we don't act. But this is where you have to be courageous. You have to Very act. courageous. You know, I and sometimes people get paralyzed by being, they get down, they get depressed. Like, oh my gosh, I'm failing. I can't believe I have to work from home. I don't know how to navigate this. Can I give you one key to success? Just start acting. Do something. I mean, you and I are doing this Facebook Live Zoom recording right now. And yeah. it's inspiring, isn't it? Yeah, no, it's funny too, because I'm looking at this and my Facebook because whenever I talk, you have to sit, sit, there, sit there and stare at your Facebook. So your Facebook Live people can only hear me through the microphone, but they can't see me. So it is. This is all new. But again, we're executing something we haven't tried before. And then once we get feedback from it, guess what we'll do? Tweak it a little bit. And then next time, it'll be a little bit better for everybody to view. So yeah, right? Well, oh, actually, they can see you, Patrick, because I've got my I'm, – I'm going very low tech here. I've got my phone pointed at my Zoom recording. Okay. Yeah, so my so face, they do see you. And, they uh, see me. All right. So all my people see you, except on Facebook Live, I, my camera just see, shows me, and then my right. Instagram shows to the computer. So yeah, yeah. My, I'm, I'm one step behind the curve. I need, I need you. I almost need another device on Facebook Live. So that well, that's why I decided to just point my screen, uh, my Facebook Live screen at the Zoom screen so they could see you too, because 
you're the good looking one of the of the of the pair of us. So I don't, you're the good looking one in my group. That, that you're um, you're on big screen on mine. So, but I, I was you know, a great illustration of attack. You know, you and I wrote this book, Millennial Boom, together, and it's been out for over a year, and we've been trying to promote it, right? And people always ask me. I hate when people ask me. So how are the book sales going, right? You get that question. Everybody. I get it. I get it almost every day that so that I I I sell a book. Someone asks me. Yeah. So I'm like, and I don't really want to answer the question. It's not a multi-million dollar New York Times bestseller. <laughs> and no, and nor were we going for that either. No, but we are experimenting with how to get more traction, right? Yeah. And that's a perfect example. Whatever your business, whatever your endeavor, whatever your ministry, whatever you're doing trial and error is the key to action yep. and and, and uh, i believe it's like a train if you because uh, a lot of people get depressed in times like this and they, they shut down correct how do you how do you get back going well it's what i call fact uh the the engine is action like the engine of the train right and feeling is the is the caboose if you okay. get that engine of action moving the feelings will follow and that's so critical. Makes you can't sense. just sit around and psych yourself up. When I feel like it, I'm going to start doing something. Nah, it doesn't work like that. No, it doesn't work like that. You can, I mean, sometimes it can. You can get those little jolts of energy, but we all realize, I mean, you don't have the passion, the energy to go forth in it. You're just, you're starting a, a dead end project too, right? Yep. Yep. And that's, and that's really, really what it is. So, and I, I want to say, so as we're all working, I've seen so many, and if you watched my Facebook live a few days ago, I talked about, um, or it was actually last week, but I talked about all the news reports. I don't know if you saw that one, Hans. I went and actually pulled up all the news reports about, you know, all the millennials being bashed in the, uh, being in, in the beaches and all yep. these different reports. And it's so funny. Because uh, Renee's like, I just think it's funny because we live in Tampa. I took a drive down to the beach. I took a picture. And then I posted that picture. The beach was empty. And I still got naysayers telling me um, who, what, when, where, and why of why it happened and who it happened to and why I was wrong. Um, but in this situation right now, and we're talking about trial and error, right? Um, yep. I, uh, just so you know, two weeks ago, I had a, uh, a meet. Actually, I'm sorry. I would say a month ago. Um, I had a gentleman, I reached out to, I said, Hey, I want to set up a zoom call. Um, I'd love, I, I want to get on virtually. And the guy goes, I don't do zoom. I mean, all caps, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point, like boom, 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 boom. And I'm like, okay, so how do you want to do it? He goes, we do conference calls. We'll send you the link and you dial into our conference call. And we were, and me and my, my buddy were like, well, geez, man, I go, we just want, no, we don't do Zoom and this is what it is. So it, it's very interesting, these generalizations, right? Because everybody's working from home, but everybody, if you watch these little memes and all the reports, it's all, they're still bashing each generation too. So right. as you talk about change, we got to look at something. So I'm going to throw some, some numbers out here because we're talking about change here too. So right now I have a breakdown of each generation where we sit today, right? But, I, but then I, what I did was I got the research from Pew Research, and what they did was they broke it down to from 12 to 17, 18 to 24, 25 to 34, and they started breaking down each generation, right? And each generation from the age of 45 to, to say, 74 that's, I, that was supposedly sitting at home at the time, right, was 40, 80, almost, I'm going to say almost 150 million, right? Our millennials and iGens that were out there that were on the beaches are 40 to 30, 30 to 40 million. So now we're looking at a course of 72 million, right? From the age of 18 to 29. Listen, generalizations happen every day. And that's my point here, right? Is that the numbers show the facts. There's 600 people in line at a grocery store between 7 and 9 a.m. And those are seniors. We're combining seniors together in certain areas, millennials together in certain areas. It happens, right? So we got to get past the generalizations. And as Han just talks about, and change is like a slinky. These changes are coming fast, and this is the time to work together, right? There's a huge amount of our population that's still in the workforce here that is, this change is happening so fast that we can help with each generation moving forward after today. 
I love what she said about the guy saying we don't do Zoom. And and I know everybody watching right now on Facebook Live or on our Zoom call, whether it's live or when I post it later, but uh, when we post it, but I'm such, I have been a huge fan of Zoom, you know, even before back when it was Skype, you know, but why? It's because 90% of communication is nonverbal. And people say, well, we can just do it by conference call. No, there is a power in seeing people's faces because 90% of communication is nonverbal, right? Yeah. And if they couldn't see our faces, they couldn't, they could only enjoy about 10% of this broadcast. True. So we're on the, let me, I want to talk a little bit about the, we're talking about changes like a slinky about the buy-in curve. I had talked, and that's actually where that chart is on page 170 of the early and late adopters uh, oh, when, it comes yeah. to in, when it comes to innovation. And those percentages are a little different than what I have in one of my other books. But uh, buy-in, in fact, a great book on change is uh, John Cotter's book called Buy-in. And of all the people out there who are experts on organizational change, John Cotter is number one, Harvard PhD yep. professor. And he's got a fantastic book called Buy-In because that's where we're at now. Uh, when in, this, in the cycle, after you attack uh, and you've already uh, accepted the need for change, you have uh, aimed at where you want to go, your point B, you're anticipating your adversaries and allies. You're on action now. You're attacking. And the next step is going to be adjusting. But before I get to that, again, you're going to have some people that buy in early and some people that won't buy in. And he, I actually list out the, the five positions that people take as changes being imposed upon them. And as we said a few moments ago, I know some of you have joined this Facebook Live after the beginning of this broadcast, a change imposed is a change opposed. And millions and tens of millions of people right now are having change imposed upon us. Go home, stay home, don't do what you normally do, and try to figure out how to work from home. And so here are the five different- Figure it out. What's that? Figure it out. Yeah, go figure it out. Uh, we had a school system here, the Denver school system, that just bought 9,000 Chromebooks to give to all their uh, the students in the Denver public school system. I thought, well, that's pretty cool. Where do you pick up 9,000 Chromebooks overnight? Apparently, they found them. I know. I guess they're more abundant than toilet paper. <laughs> Okay, so the buy-in, yeah. the buy-in curve, and this starts with the the people who are the the most likely to adopt a change, and the people least likely. And those of you who are leaders out there, and you're listening to this, you need to recognize your people will not be like you. I've okay. always been. Everybody knows I'm an innovator. I'm a change agent, and people used to say, Hans, I'm glad we have a change agent as our CEO. But I learned really quickly that I had to lead everybody, not just the people who were like me. And it makes perfect sense. Right, number one, yes, these are the innovators and the and the inventors. Uh, sure, let's do it. Next, number two, I'm willing to be convinced. Number three, I'll do a gradual buy-in. Number okay. four, I'm somewhat reluctant. These are the late bloomers, I call yep. them. And number five, over my dead body. <laughs> I am not going to change. Yeah. Guess what? If you're a leader of a business, an organization, anything, uh, a ministry, you have to work with all the people in that continuum. Yeah. And that's where we're going to get in a moment to one of our final topics about listening, that the key to great leadership is to listen to everybody and to gradually, carefully carry them along instead of being obnoxious and just saying it's going to be my way or the highway. It's true. It's true. You know, can I, let me throw something at you. So Please. I was on, I was on an interview this last two last week. Geez, all the weeks are like together for me right now. It's always has been, but this is even worse. So I was on an interview and we were talking about natives versus settlers from our book, Millennial Boom. And I got a message and the gentleman messaged me at first. And this is why I did the interview with him. And he goes, 
I need your definition of native versus sellers. I read the book, but what's your definition? I get my definition, how we kind of imposed it, right? Of what our opinions were. And he goes, man, I got my own opinion. Can I give it to you? And I said, yeah, I'd love to hear it. And he goes, exactly how you were just talking about the adopt, late adopters versus early. And he goes, I believe now, if you look at technology, um, your, your settlers are the ones that are just complacent now. They're, I don't do Zoom. I use this way, right? They're still in those ways of the, uh, they're, they've settled for it, right? They've settled where technology is. As your wife says, Donna, she uses it as a servant. So she hasn't settled. She's constantly using it as her servant. She's using it moving forward. And this gentleman then said, I feel like you're a native, Patrick. And I said, why would you say that? He goes, because you're constantly always on the next thing. You're always listening to what's happening with tech. How are you developing? He goes, he goes two years ago, he goes, I never thought you'd be, you know, I watched you. I never thought you were doing a podcast, this guy from produce and supply chain. Now you're doing Zoom calls and this. And, I, and it really hit me. And I was like, wait a minute. This is very true because as technology is always and ever changing, we ourselves now, we need to figure out if we're going to be a native to this technology and keep ever changing and it evolves or be a settler and resist it. And, and that stuck out just now to me too, as you were just talking about that change. Think about it in the world of technology. That gentleman two, a month ago, no Zoom. I guarantee you his manager is having him on every single Zoom call. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, when you think about uh, the natives versus settlers, and I think about the old west, and I just imagine a, a cabin out on the prairie and the mom and dad and the kids, and, and uh, they've settled down there. And, and the, back actually in the day, the, um, the, the, the Native Americans – help the settlers it wasn't always warfare right that, you start learning to get out of the cabin and instead of living in fear you learn to go out and embrace change because it's a brave new world yep it's it's very true very true i was when i was a kid real quick i got one other little quick story when i was a kid they gave us a story about fear we read I don't. It was a short. It was a short story, but you might have heard of it. It was about the snake in the in the in the bed, and this gentleman was laying in bed, and his wife came to bring uh, him soup, and he told her, "Don't move. There's a rattlesnake in my bed. If I move, I'm gonna get bit. I will die instantly." And the gentleman laid in bed for you know the whole story. He laid in bed to the end of the story of him getting out, and there being no snake there, and it literally talks about really how fear can kill you. I mean, literally freeze your entire life. It can do it to you. Back to the slinky. Change is like a slinky. And that's exactly right. We may be afraid to send it down the stairs because we don't know where it's going to end up. Yeah. And uh, that's the number one reason why people are afraid to change. You know, that guy who said, we don't do Zoom. You know what? He's afraid of it, right? He's locked. He's got yeah. hardening of the categories, I call it. And he's locked into the old ways and he's afraid. Uh -huh. He's afraid of Zoom. I bet he's afraid to admit he doesn't know how to do it and he's going to lose face and he's going to yep. be embarrassed. And he's the expert. Like, like you and I, we screwed up so bad. The first, we, This is our third attempt at this thing today. <laughs> and so what? Doesn't matter. Yeah. It's the, it doesn't. You broke up a couple of times and I was like, oh no, don't, don't. And I was like, ah, we'll start over if it breaks up again. But it's true. I think you're right. So don't I, be afraid of where the slinky's going to end up. Just send it down the stairs and get moving with action. Um, yes. Yes. Let's, Execution. Let's, let's finish the, the last one, align, alignment, number six. And these are the six stages of bringing about change. And it's a cycle that actually keeps going over and over and over again. And it's messy and they're not always in uh, sequence with one another, but alignment, you know, our son, Jeremy, uh, he had some crazy cars when, when he was growing up and he had this, um, this old Eagle, Eagle uh, Fallon, I think it was. Uh, and uh, I remember he bought it for like 500 bucks. I remember the day we bought it and he asked me to look at it and I said, I don't think you should buy it. It looks like a piece of junk, but he bought it cause he wanted to work on it. And it yeah. had the worst. Have you ever driven a car that is seriously out of alignment? Uh, no, nope, never have. Well, it doesn't work. No, it, it wobbles. You can't go fast. 
<laughs> and it tears up the tires. And organizations that are not in alignment wobble, can't go fast, Ooh. and the tires work out. Uh, wear that out. is a great, great analogy. There. I love that. You're right. That is and, so true. And what is alignment? That's when everybody's on the same page of the hymn book, as we like to say it. Everybody's on the same page from the top to the bottom. I'm, I've been consulting with an organization right now that has the worst alignment I've ever seen, meaning the board of directors is on one page. The top leadership is on a completely different page. And yep. the workers are on a third page. Yeah. And guess what? There's tremendous discouragement. There's lack of productivity. Things are not getting done. Morale is so low. And the problem is alignment. Yeah, I agree. We and, see that in so many companies. Yeah, so many companies. Uh, the board is not, not on the same page. And so to me, one of the top jobs of a leader is to bring about alignment. And how do you, how do you suppose you bring about alignment? Well, you have to get everybody... Uh, you got to communicate a lot. And I'm on the board of, of a, one uh, on my college where I went to school, Columbia International University, and it's a joy to be on the, the board. And I, I constantly interact with the president so that I know what's going on. And there you go. Hey, what page is that? So on page, uh, yeah, page 152, exactly what you're talking about right now. Page 152. Oh, yeah. It's like a target. The board circle, the inner circle of leadership, general management circle, key stakeholders. You're, you're so right. So I'm going to throw out a, um, um, a current event, and I'm not going to say the name of the company, but in my industry, uh, a company just laid off 700 employees last Friday. So five days ago, 700 employees were laid off due to this coronavirus crisis. Uh, coronavirus crisis. Woo! Say that fast three times. Wow. Wow. Um, so it was interesting to me because how is that happening? Right. And I think it goes back to alignment and then it also goes back to this, this right, this right here. Right. So if you look at it, the board, the president, right. And remember this president, you're probably making a million and a half a year. They, they laid off 700 employees that the article said anywhere from you know, employees that make $35,000 a year all the way up to, you know, $150,000 a year. People that have worked there from nine months all the way to 20 years, people got laid off, right? And maybe, maybe they're setting an example for what's going to happen in the future. But I just believe that as, a, as an alignment, like you're saying that these, all of these levels were aligned because how can you lay off that many people within the organization all the way down to the janitor up to someone who's making you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. That means each person was, like you just said, each one of those, um, what would you call them? Uh, the leadership categories? Oh, uh, circles, uh, circles of ownership. So each of those circles of ownership had their own sense of ownership, which is why now the lower people are getting laid off and they're still making a million dollar salary. Because last time I checked in the news and the stocks, because they're publicly traded, they didn't, cut their $1.5 million salary down. Right. They laid off over three to $4 million in salaries. Now, again, maybe this is, they're just, it's the worst of yet that's going to come. And maybe they're just being in the forefront of it. But again, there should be things, you know, alignment, alignment, right. alignment, alignment. Yeah. Let's finish with the topic of listening. Cause that's one of my favorite. Uh, how do you bring about alignment? Well, you won't bring about alignment as often you do is talk and you never listen. Uh, alignment happens with communication through all those circles of ownership uh, from the board to the owners, to the workers, to the frontline customer service people. Yet yeah, it's a circles of ownership from the inside out. And the more communication there is between all those circles, the more alignment you'll have. And if yes. you drive a car like a great German car, like a Porsche uh, that has great alignment, I tell you what, you can go so fast. <laughs> alignment is such a key. I always say, Patrick, as you know, the most important word in a leader's vocabulary is listen. Right. Listen and learn. And in times of change like we're living in right now, there's nothing more important than to listen to other people who are being successful, uh, who are navigating this. Take a big pill of humility 
uh, like yep. that guy who said we don't do Zoom. That is just pure arrogance. Take a big pill of humility and say, I'm going to learn new stuff. I'm going to learn how to do things differently so that I can change so that I can survive and thrive. I agree. I agree. Shout out to um, my professor from college, Dr. William Rice. He taught me at a, at, a, at a good age is to think about how to think about things differently. Yeah. Right. And, exactly. and that was him. Right. So I, I, I totally, I totally, totally agree with you. So if we were to say, you know, as we're into this listening stage, um, how do you feel since we're on zoom, right? Cause, and, and I can do this right now. And I'm going to just for our audience. So bam. So now we're in the middle of the COV ID and I just shut you out, right? We're in the middle of a conference call and I just shut you out. Um, now let's talk about that. This is not disrespect. This is not anything. I, I, I believe that this is just a sense too of just like having to blow your nose or walk out of the room. If you, if you got to pass gas, right? I mean, think about that. Some of these things too, that we have for technology, right? Um, where we're at, I'm going to shut you out of the system for a second, or I might do this. The, right? Exactly. Now I see Donna, Donna and Hans. So during this, during this time period, as Hans is talking about all these different areas too, um, this is a time, right, of massive, massive change. And if we read and go through um, the, six, the phases again, I mean, accept, aim, anticipate, attack, adjust, and align. Those are six powerful words. Powerful. Yep. yep, they are. And remember, in times of change, learners inherit the earth. Yep, you're right. They find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. By the way, people are asking, where can we get the book? And I know my friend in Budapest was asking me where to get it. And uh, Amazon. Uh, it's sold wherever books are sold. But as we know, most books are sold on Amazon. So change is like a slinky. Correct. And I'm not sure right now with shipping. I think right now with Amazon, it's four to six weeks behind right now if it's not essential goods. Um, so well, it's that's not, not entirely true because I've been really I, no, I, I bought a few things uh, hardware in the last couple of days and it showed up as normal. In three or oh, four you are lucky. I've already had stuff tell me that it's not going to be delivered and to expect delays. I was trying to order some more podcast equipment. It and depends on, I guess it depends on the suppliers, but that's, yeah, I green screen, but either way. So, uh, I agree though. Amazon's the best way I'm going to try and Hans and I had to get back on and do a little bit more, um, more on millennial boom. I got a couple more ideas for Hans with his blue book of leadership as well. And also the top 10 ways, uh, of leadership. What is it? I'm sorry. The top 10 leadership. ways to be a great leader top 10 ways to be a great leader. Sorry. I have that also on the shelf that I've been reading while I've been through this crisis as well. Um, but again, if anybody has any questions, wants to reach out to us, um, we're going to go ahead and do another live session again next week. We don't know what's what could be millennial boom, could be leadership, but either way we want to support you during this time. Um, Kindle, uh, we have millennial boom on Kindle. Um, so you do not have to order it. So if you do want to check true. out millennial boom yeah. too, we the millennial boom on kindle um and we we will be coming out hopefully with a little promotion for you guys here soon um check out millennialboomnow.com and we appreciate everybody for for watching and, and tuning in today hans yeah we'll see you and hang in there and remember uh be willing to embrace change it can be the best thing that ever happened to you thanks patrick all the time all right hans we'll see you soon bye everyone